Lady Godiva has been immortalised in some strange ways, giving her name both to a brand of chocolates and a line in Queen's Don't Stop Me Now. Yet it's fascinating that the start of an 11th century story continues to have an impact even now. For some, she's simply the woman who rode naked through the streets of Coventry. To others, she's an icon of selfless actions to benefit the less privileged. The truth, we should suspect, is somewhat different. Yet the story preserves the ethos, if not the actual fact, of what may have happened all those centuries ago. So in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore, let's go and meet Lady Godiva and see if we can unravel some semblance of truth from the legends that have wrapped themselves around her. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are continuing with this month's theme of real people who somehow have legends associated with them that may or may not be exaggerated, shall we say. I don't want to necessarily say that they're not true, but I do think that they might not exactly be quite how the legends say they are. And we've already looked at Boudicca, we looked at Dick Whittington last week, which was really funny because every time I try to schedule anything involving Dick Whittington, I kept getting notifications from different platforms about my use of profanity. And I'm like, no, no, it's a name, it's okay. But anyway, I hopefully won't have this problem with Lady Godiva this week. And I am going to go through the legend because I am aware that she may not necessarily have a huge following outside of the UK. So I will go through the legend first and bring you up to speed. And I also wanted to let you know who we're going to do for the final week. And this was a request. And I must admit, I read it and went, I can't believe I didn't think of that one. That's an absolute genius suggestion. And that's going to be Elizabeth Bathory, the so-called countess who allegedly bathed in virgin's blood in Hungary. So we're going to have a look at her next week. And she's really interesting. So that's going to be quite a fun episode to round the month off with. But we are obviously here for Lady Godiva, so I am going to get on with her legend. So Lady Godiva was a noblewoman married to Leofric, Earl of Mercia and Lord of Coventry. Now Leofric levied a series of crippling taxes on Coventry citizens who struggled to pay them. Feeling a burst of compassion for her people, Godiva repeatedly asked Leofric to lower the taxes, and Leofric refused. As the story goes, he said he would only do so if she rode naked through the town centre on horseback. Fair enough, thought Godiva. She then instructed the people of Coventry to stay indoors on market day and to keep themselves from watching her parade. Godiva then stripped, climbed on the horse, used her long hair to cover all of her body except her legs and galloped through the town. One man, apparently named Tom, ignored her instructions to sneak a peek at her and was allegedly struck blind. Godiva returned home following this particular parade and confronted Leofric. Surprised she'd taken him seriously, Thankful that no one saw her and impressed at her courage, Leofric agreed to reduce the taxes and Godiva became a local legend. So that's how the story generally goes in somewhat condensed form. So the first question to ask is, is it true? Well, Lady Godiva was a real person. She was born in AD 990 and she's believed to have died somewhere between AD 1066 and 1086. Some sources refer to her as Godgafu. And she had a reputation for generosity, particularly towards the church. Now, the same cannot be said of Leofric, and he derived his power from the Danish king Canute and persecuted the church. And he levied a severe tax called the Herregeld from the people of Coventry, and this tax actually paid for Canute's bodyguards. Now, Godiva would actually charge her own taxes since Coventry was actually her possession, but the Herregeld was collected by the earls on Canute's behalf, so she didn't really have any control over that. Now, the earls could grant relief from it and had done so at Bury St Edmunds, so therefore it's not impossible that Leofric did the same in Coventry. And in Randolph Higdon's Polychronicon, he notes that Leofric abolished all taxes except those on horses. And during Edward I's reign, someone investigated this, I'm not sure why, and apparently no taxes were paid in Coventry at this time, apart from those paid on horses. Now, accounts of Godiva's life from that period do tend to focus on the fact that she was one of the few female landowners, and Coventry itself constituted one of her properties. But it is really important to note that none of the contemporary records mention a naked ride through the town. That's the kind of thing that would stand out. 
That said, the legend even claims Leofric actually changed religion after Godiva's stunt, founding a Benedictine monastery with her. Now, this did happen in 1043, because the Danes destroyed St. Osberg's nunnery in 1016, and then Leofric and Godiva founded a Benedictine house on the site. Now, Leofric was actually buried in the Abbey Church in 1057, and Godiva was apparently buried there 10 years later. Now, St. Mary's Cathedral was then built in the 13th century on top of the Saxon church, but sadly, archaeologists didn't find Godiva's grave in 1967 while they were excavating the Coventry Abbey site. But Leofric's change of heart is sometimes ascribed to a heavenly vision that actually prompted his religious conversion. And H.R. Ellis Davidson suggests that Godiva may have performed some sort of symbolic act to encourage the end of the tax. Over time, this could have then been twisted into the naked horseback ride. So it is possible that there is some kind of nugget of truth at the the centre of it that has just been distorted over time. Now, the first mention of the story is in the Chronica by Roger of Wendover in the 12th century. And he wasn't exactly famous for historical accuracy, nor was he writing at the time. And indeed, much like Boudicca, we actually have very few contemporary descriptions of Godiva. Any assumptions people do make about her or her character almost entirely come from her legend or just inferring whatever can be inferred from the documents that do exist. And the other thing that we'll have to bear in mind is that the legend does undergo a change. So up until the 17th century, Godiva hasn't issued any orders not to look out of the window on market day. And instead, Leofric believes it's just simply a miracle that Godiva had ridden naked and that no one had seen her. And it's this miracle that apparently prompts his religious conversion. But in the 17th century, the legend changed. And in this newer version, Godiva sent word not to open any shutters. The implication here is that Godiva's popularity with the citizens meant that they knew they would benefit from her actions, and therefore it was in their best interest to comply with her request. Peeping Tom, on the other hand, is struck blind by God for disobeying this particular request. Now, this change in the legend demonstrates the way in which stories do change and evolve over time, but the more that they do change, the more we then have to question which parts are based on fact and which are just simply artistic license. So, ultimately, where does the story actually come from? Well, an article in an 1883 edition of the Newcastle Quran actually suggested a possible origin for the story, and the writer notes that Lady Godiva gave all her treasures to the new monastery. All her silver and gold became crosses or images of the saints. And as the writer explains, and I quote, For the love of God and the service of the church, she literally denuded herself of all her personal property, end quote. So in this case, perhaps her metaphorical nudity created by donating her personal possessions to the church over time became literal nudity. This kind of thing does happen with stories. And indeed, John Welford suggests a mistranslation on Roger of Wendover's part, which also happens. And here the term denuded, in the Latin form, may have become muddied. So Welford actually theorises that she rode stripped of her finery, which would have made a lot more sense. So she might have just simply rode dressed as one of the common people she aimed to help. But then Roger of Wendover's mistranslated that as stripped in a physical sense. And then that obviously gives us the naked interpretation. And if you're going to go with that, you need a backstory, which then gives rise to the legend. And obviously, giving all of your treasures to the church is a bit of a far cry from ending a heavy tax. And we don't actually know if she really did get the taxes lowered. But the evidence of tax paying in Coventry would suggest that something did change. So, perhaps Welford's interpretation is closer to the truth that Godiva did carry out some kind of symbolic act on behalf of the people and basically it was a mistranslation that gave rise to the whole naked horseback thing. And if this is the case, then Godiva probably could be quite considered as a kind of benevolent landowner who did intervene on behalf of her people. So ultimately that part of the legend would remain true. But why is it such a famous story? Well, let's be honest, the myth is a pretty good one and it has become quite a popular subject for songs and Alfred Lord Tennyson also wrote the poem Godiva in 1840. And ultimately, it depicts an apparently demure wife standing up to a tyrannical lord on behalf of the people. And let's be honest, what's not to like about that? If you then add the lascivious thrill of a naked horseback ride and the lord's change of heart, then you do have the ingredients for a pretty memorable tale. And like I say, there's quite a lot to like about Godiva when you look at all the different bits and pieces that appear in the legend over time. Clearly, around Coventry, there's also plenty to mark the story. So there's the Lady Godiva clock tower, which commemorates the legend. And every hour, Lady Godiva emerges on horseback from the right-hand door of the clock, goes across in front, and then disappears from view out the left. And Peeping Tom appears at a window above the clock. 
Now, the city unveiled a bronze statue of Godiva in 1949, and this was the first statue of her, and in a wonderful twist of irony, the covering actually stuck to her during the ceremony, and workmen had to pull them down to finish the unveiling, and I just thought that was fabulous. But the thing that is perhaps done the most to keep the story alive is the Godiva festival and its various forebears. Now, the legend claims that monks told the story while processing through the streets, so doing a procession would be a really good way to actually mark the story. And later Coventry processions helped to preserve the folklore and solidify the legend. And this is also one thing that we do need to remember about folklore, that it does include things that people do to remember things and commemorations of things, because things like a procession are ways that people are preserving memory for the people, if that makes sense. So it's rather than it being written down, it's actually reenacted instead. And I think that's quite an important thing to remember. But the yearly procession was part of a Coventry Great Fair in the Middle Ages and that lasted for eight days. And then obviously, like you might imagine, it became a lot more sober following the Reformation. And then after the Restoration, when Charles II came to the throne, the fair became a lot more elaborate, as you'd sort of expect under Charles II. I mean, he wasn't called the Merry Monarch for nothing, you know what I mean? But Godiva was actually represented by a boy until 1765, when a woman on a white horse finally took on the role. Now, the Lady Godiva procession was held intermittently throughout the 19th century, with the 1862 procession described as a magnificent spectacle that comprised about 300 men, 70 children and upwards of 150 horses. So these are pretty big events. And obviously, like I say, these fairs and processions gave a great excuse to remember the story simply through repetition. Now, I should also point out that the story does actually link with folklore, Because there's the fairy midwife story type in which a human gets the ability to see the fairies but see something that they shouldn't and ends up blind. And obviously other story types also follow a similar pattern. And this then links into that idea around Peeping Tom, the fact that he looks out when he shouldn't. He sees Godiva and is then struck blind for this. Now Davidson doesn't think that Peeping Tom is part of a pre-Christian tradition like some people have actually suggested. But rather that these other tales and this idea of seeing something you shouldn't get struck blind help to explain why Peeping Tom ultimately became part of the legend. And there's also this really peculiar and really quite unpleasant folk motif of husbands challenging wives to do an impossible task. And one that's often cited is the legend of the Tichborne Dole. And the dole was an annual gift of flour given to parishioners in Tichborne, Hampshire, on Lady Day, which is the 25th of March. And in the 12th century, Lady Mabella, the wife of Sir Henry de Tichborne, was dying. Now, this charitable and seemingly kind woman asked her husband to set aside land in her name to support the poor once she'd gone. And obviously this idea was around providing this dole. Now, Sir Henry gave her a burning torch and told her that she could have as much land as she could walk around before the flame went out, which is a really horrible thing to do to someone who's dying. Now, despite her advanced illness, she still managed to crawl around 23 acres and the area is still known as the crawls and flour made from wheat grown here is also distributed by the church. And I must admit, I'm, like Lady Mabella, I just think is an absolute legend because she also managed to lay a curse on Sir Henry so that the family had to continue giving the dole if they wanted to keep prospering. So I like the fact that she built a bit of a fail safe into that particular way of doing things. But in this case, the kind wife does something humiliating to benefit the people at the order of a tyrannical husband. And basically, the Godiva story fits the same type Now, obviously, this story is later because it's the 12th century, but it does still fit into that idea of just nasty men making women do something awful because they're trying to benefit other people. Now, Davidson does suggest that peeping Tom as a different element may have been a joke at first. And somebody found a note in the margin of Camden's Britannia that explained the book's owner saw a peculiar statue in 1659 in Coventry. And someone told him it represented a man who tried to see Godiva and ended up blind as a result. And for Davison, this sounds a bit like a local joke that someone's maybe said to like an out-of-towner going, oh, you'll never guess this. But then it was written down and then it basically became part of the legend. So that's possible because Peeping Tom doesn't actually appear again until an account from the late 17th century, by which point he becomes a stand-in for body and somewhat lewd behaviour. So it is quite interesting that you do have this weird little joke comment, which does seem to have a little bit more influence than it should, shall we say. So what do we ultimately make of it all? Well, the lack of specific contemporary sources is a little bit of a shame, and the only thing that can apparently be substantiated is the suspension of taxes in the period. Now, that does give us an indication that the legend was based on a kernel of truth, 
although it is a bit less likely that Godiva actually rode naked through the streets on horseback. Although, like, to be honest, I wouldn't rule out the fact that she did still do the ride, but I do think the idea of uh, going out dressed as one of the common people makes a bit more sense, and I think that bit you kind of go, yeah, I can, I can see that happening. And this is the thing, though, that kernel of possible truth does actually suggest that her reputation for charity and benevolence is deserved. And it also shows that women in this period occupied a very different position than we might imagine them to, especially among the upper classes. So I think in that regard as well, she's a very interesting woman. And if we take nothing else from the story, we should remember that if we want to help others, sometimes it can come at some kind of cost or discomfort to us, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. If anything, we should probably do it more. And we should also let the legend inspire us. So if Godiva could apparently ride naked through the streets to lower taxes, then us putting ourselves out to help those less fortunate should be a lot easier in the digital age. So what I want to know is what do you think of the Lady Godiva legend? Is that the first time you'd ever come across it? Did you often wonder what that line about Lady Godiva meant in the Queen song? Do let me know. Like I say, next week we are going to be moving on to a very, very different woman. Like completely opposite end of the spectrum of the people that we've done so far. So this is going to be interesting. And yeah, it is the idea of did Elizabeth Bathory actually bathe in the blood of virgins? So yeah, we are going to have a look at some of the really quite bizarre legends that have built up around this particular woman who did go on to inspire the film Countess Dracula that Hammer made. So like, just take that with a pinch of salt, basically. But anyway, we'll have a look at that next week. And I do also have some things in for February so far, but as ever, you can always feel free to drop me a request. Some of the requests I've had, obviously I haven't covered because I've already done them as episodes before. Some of them are on my list of things to do. And every now and then I get a request where I'm like, I don't, I, that's not actually something that I'm going to cover. So I've had a couple of people ask for Romany folklore, but as I'm not Romany, I'm not going to be sharing that on the show. So just bear that in mind. But I hope that you've enjoyed this week's episode. The bonus episode is going to be more legends associated with famous people, including the likes of Edward the Black Prince and Elizabeth I. If you are interested in that, you can become a member of the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon for three fifty a month and you'll be able to see that. There will also be an illustrated talk if you become a member at the £5 a month where we're going to have a look at the many faces of Medusa. So if you are interested in those kind of things, check out the Patreon link in the show notes. But without any further ado, I hope that you have a marvellous weekend ahead and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.